I don't know much about Sonic fan games, and I never really followed the production of Galaxy Trail's Freedom Planet, but boy did I enjoy it. And uh, boy, boy did it stick with me. Freedom Planet was a bright, colourful, wonderfully designed 2D platformer that had tight controls, characters that were a joy to observe, and a sick OST. Overall, it was a hugely positive experience, even with the few kind of bullshit moments indicative of older games of the genre. I wasn't really sure what I was in for when I bought Freedom Planet, other than furries on a mission, but I dropped my money on Steam, booted it up, and was massively surprised. It absolutely deserved the praise and its successful Kickstarter. One of its few criticisms, however, lied in its storytelling. Now I've seen people drop the line typical of Sonic fan fiction when describing this game's narrative, mostly in the derogatory sense. I can't say I disagree, but to write it off because of that is kind of shitty. For me, it's charming at best, but a little grating and unfortunately immature at worst. Most people get used to the amateur voice acting and slightly all over the place script pretty quickly, but idiots like me still felt a little dissatisfied with the story constantly falling back on having to say, hey, don't worry about it. That in itself isn't a bad thing, of course, but Freedom Planet, eight years later, got a sequel. Freedom Planet 2's story actually ends up dealing with way more mature themes that, unfortunately, are not handled as well as they deserve to be. It makes for a narrative and tonal mishmash that is hard to ignore when the credits are rolling come your second playthrough. The result is a story that screams to be much more than what it is. Someone once told me that Edwin Tiong, one of the writers for both of the games, didn't want to bring the mood down too much after people raised criticisms about the edgier and darker moments of the first game, but it has the side effect of being too afraid to really engage in the drama that the game promised in its promotional material. The game itself though? Incredible, fantastic, an absolute blast to play, an instant recommend. Every gripe I have with the franchise's narrative is absolutely not to be taken as a negative review. These games rule and are tons of fun to play, albeit the first is a little rough after Freedom Planet 2's additions to its core gameplay and the overall accessibility. I only feel the need to even talk about the story because I also kind of fucking love the characters and am unhealthily obsessed with speculating about the opportunities that it missed. So, um, uh, yeah. Let's talk about Freedom Planet. We kick things off with the most obvious question. What is Freedom Planet about? Simply put, it's a game about Lilac, Carol and Mila, otherwise known as Team Lilac, we'll talk about the name later, okay? kicking ass alongside Talk, an alien who was pursuing an intergalactic warlord named Arctivus Brevin, both of whom became stranded on the planet. Brevin, after covertly taking over the kingdom of Shui Gang, killing the king and placing his brainwashed son Prince Dale on the throne, begins instigating a conflict between Shui Gang and the neighbouring kingdoms of Shangtu and Shangbu. This is done so he can acquire the Kingdom Stone, an ancient artifact that has powered the world's technology for hundreds of years. Brevin's plan is to use it to fuel his dreadnought and get off the planet, on top of boosting the overall strength of his army. Huh? Lilac and Carol witness Talk's ship crashing, and they rush to help, where they discover one of Brevin's henchmen, Serpentine, attacking him. They escape, and Talk, in disguise at this point, warns them that Shang Mu is going to attempt to steal the Kingdom Stone. Carol and I are pretty fast. We could run over there for you. Seriously? Yup, I've got a motorcycle and she's a dragon. They're like, super fast. Darn straight. Despite Lilac and Carol's attempts to warn Shangtu officials Gong and Nira, the Kingdom Stone is taken by Spade, Carol and Lilac's old partner, and King Dale's brother, who fucks off and leaves them to deal with the Temple Guardian. After Carol is saved from a cave-in by Mila, she joins the group, and later that night they find Torg out of disguise, and he reveals the truth of his and Brevin's involvement. I'm from another world. Actually... I'm part of an alliance between many different worlds. We're called Chasers. So, why do a bunch of aliens care about our planet? The man that wants your kingdom stone isn't from around here either. He calls himself Lord Brevin. Brevin is the most powerful enemy we've ever faced. Hundreds of worlds destroyed. Thousands of heroes killed or corrupted. Enormous amounts of weapon energy stolen. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Welcome aboard, ladies. Yes! Awesome. Wonderful!
The next day, they meet up with Gong, and the team is sent to get the stone back from Zhao as a neutral party. Upon arrival, Revan and Dale's forces attack Shang Mu, and our heroes do battle with Serpentine, and in the chaos of the fighting, Revan seizes the Kingdom Stone for himself. Mayor Zhao treats Team Lilac to dinner as thanks for helping to remove the threat, and we're treated to a small history lesson. The group suggests that Zhao send them to Shang Tu to explain the situation and garner the Kingdom's support, and he agrees, lending them his airship. It's smooth sailing at first, but they're attacked along the way by Dale, who manages to drop their airship into a river. Huh! So that's why your airships are boat-shaped. When they eventually arrive at Shang Tu, Nira incarcerates them on suspicion of being Shang Mu spies, and after a false confession to set talk free, Team Lilac bust out themselves. They escape pursuit by Nira only to witness Talk getting captured by Brevin, and are once more ambushed by Serpentine. The battle is won, but the tensions are high. Maybe we're not cut out for this. We should go home. So that's it? We just leave and let Tork die? What are we supposed to do? I like Tork, but this is so much bigger than us. That doesn't mean anything. Sometimes I feel like you're trying to get us killed. How can you say that? I put myself out there on the front line so you don't have to! Yeah, and I always have to bail you out. What's the problem with that? We're helping each other do the right thing. But I don't want to do the right thing! I just want to spend time with my best friend! If the only way I can do that is by risking my life, maybe we shouldn't be friends. Carol... Don't! Just don't. Lilac goes after Tork alone after an intense argument with Carol, who, along with Mila, decides to convince Spade that Brevin is indeed his father's murderer. While that is happening, Lilac assaults Brevin's base but ends up also captured. She is tortured as a means to extract information from Tork, but manages to escape when Carol comes to the rescue. No! No! Stand down! I have to find them! There are two ways we can do this, dragon. And you're only conscious in one of them. The Injured and separated from her friends, Lilac is brought to Shang Tu, where she is given a mission by the Magister to explore the ancient ruins of Pangu Lagoon, a place they were originally afraid to excavate due to the fear of an unknown material. Lilac agrees and heads to the lagoon, and gets covered in bees before reaching the inner sanctum, whereupon she discovers one of the ancient dragons. It and Lilac do battle, and once it is won, Lilac discovers that the dragon is actually a drone called Pangu. It then clues in Lilac on the true history of the Kingdom Stone, which she then shows to the Magister, who informs her that in her absence, Shang Mu is on the way to invade Shui Gan. He sent his army to stall them, but is unsure of how long. So, Lilac rides Pangu in its dragon form to the field in Shui Gan, and halts the impending battle between the kingdoms of Shang Mu and Tu. She is reunited with the others, who had been picked up along the way by Gong, and they all form a plan to take back the Kingdom Stone. Using Pangu and the now united armies, Team Lilac manage to storm Brevin's ship as he prepares to leave, and in its ascent, they fight their way through its troops, including a monstrously mutated Serpentine. They reach the Kingdom Stone, but Brevin is prepared and takes Mila hostage. He forces the group to fight her by using his weird fucked up space science, causing her to mutate like Serpentine had. When she is defeated, they move on to Brevin himself, who's now made the fight very personal. Lord Arctivus motherfucking Brevin, however, isn't going to back down from the challenge. I will destroy everything you throw at me! I will make you pay for what you have done! I'd like to see you try. After a grueling and bitter battle, Brevin is finally defeated. His ship is destroyed, but the Kingdom Stone goes up with it. She's alive! After Mila awakens in a medical tent, the group start to lament the loss of the Kingdom Stone and what it might mean for the future, before Carol tells them to look to the sky. There they see the Kingdom Stone is spreading its energy across the world in a new form. As a result, the Kingdoms resolve their differences, now that they no longer have to fight for energy, 
and the world becomes a freedom planet. This immensely abridged version omits the finer details, but that is the gist of it. A fairly simple, self-contained story that you can ultimately ignore and still enjoy the game. Of course, not having the story back up the journey means the levels don't really have much cohesion between them, unlike, say, Sonic 3, where every stage end kind of blends into the next. In classic mode, it honestly doesn't matter as the gameplay is put front and centre, but we're not talking about the gameplay here. So, let's look into a couple of the elements and characters, and what we know about them, and the little drops of lore that it represents. Some of this is grabbed from pre-sequel lore that is available in its archived form, while the rest is either stated in-game or subject to fan theory, mine or otherwise. Long ago, a magnificent creature soared across Avalis in a ball of fire. When it landed, our ancestors were so captivated by its power and beauty that they built three kingdoms in its honor. Shangmu, Shangtu, and Shui Gang? Bingo! And when the cities were built, the dragon transformed into the legendary Kingdom Stone we know and love today. So as we see it, the Kingdom Stone is an artifact that is responsible for providing energy to the world. It is a MacGuffin that is about the size of your torso, so not huge. It is located in some ancient ruins, and it's unclear how the kingdoms really benefit from its power beyond it being a glorified battery, and how it distributes that energy is not ever really shown. Lilac, when she discovers Pangu in the lagoon, is treated to the truth behind that legend. Records outright state that the dragon from the sky was in fact a race of dragons from space who became stranded on the planet. They couldn't find a way off, so instead they decided to help civilization thrive. The Kingdom Stone is simply a condensed sphere of their energy reserves, and the dragons slowly disappeared, their presence and influence all but replaced by the legend the Avalesians share today. Alongside a promise of more information that is locked away inside Pangu, the dragons left behind the hope that one day, when they are ready, Avalis will also reach for the stars using the Kingdom Stone's power. The Kingdom Stone is seldom mentioned after the events of Freedom Planet 1, and it's not till the second game that this race of dragons is further built upon, and history gets dark. But for now, we're given enough to go on that glues the first game's narrative together just fine. In the heydays of Freedom Planet being a Sonic fan game, Sabrina Dadura reached out to Chinese artist Jia Liang to use her OCs Lilac, Carol, and Mila respectively. We start with Lilac, who's a plucky, heroic mid-team with whip-like hair and boost for days, who was redesigned from a hedgehog to a dragon for the franchise. On Avalis, her dragon heritage is rare, but mostly unimpressive to the majority of the planet's populace, if it's even noticed at all. A little odd, seeing how the dragons are revered, but it could be due to a case of watered-down bloodlines and all that jazz. Accompanying her is Carol, a 12-year-old high-kicking wildcat with no respect for physics when she gets on her bike. Her outlook on life is way more carefree than Lilac's, but despite this, she's a good person at heart and has Lilac's back, although in turn she's not above a little mischief herself. She and Lilac are orphans who at a very early age fell in with a group of notorious thieves and assassins named the Red Scarves. You are a ninja? Uh, not really. The two of them were always managing to keep their hands clean of the murder aspect of the group and at some point, somehow, they just left. Surprisingly, they got away mostly scot-free with only a criminal record for theft, and Lilac is making up for it by being an intrepid hero whenever she can be. Sometimes, this is to her detriment, as it's bordering on hero complex, often forgetting her friends aren't as gung-ho as she is. As important as Carol is as a supporting character, she has no real importance in regards to the world. The same can mostly be said of Mila, who only comes into the story a little after the second stage. She's the youngest of the group, at 10 years old, and is gifted with the bizarre power that lets her form shapes of energy to use as a shield or as a weapon. Phew! Her primary motive is to find her estranged parents, but joins Team Lilac to focus on the current Brevin problem, even with her incredibly innocent and conflict-averse nature. Despite that, she is also remarkably brave, and willing to throw herself into danger to help out her allies. She mostly exists to drive the drama in the closing stages of the game when she becomes mutated, but otherwise, she's a perfectly fine addition to the main cast and is a constant source of cute brevity. That is until you punch a hole directly through her face. <laughs> Why would I say something like that? <laughs> uh, anyway, moving on. First up, Tork is a member of the Spectrum Chasers, peacekeepers affiliated with the Coalition of Planets. Meanwhile, Brevin hails from an unnamed planetary empire that has conquered throughout the galaxy. Tork pursues Brevin not just through his obligations as a peacekeeper, but also for killing his crew, which is partly why he's a little reluctant to have Team Lilac help him out at first. Due to planetary regulations, Tork is massively secretive of the Spaceborne origins, but is willing to share the truth to stop Brevin. When the events of the first game are over, his and Brevin's presence are mostly covered up at his behest, so the world is strangely unaware of the intergalactic nature of the conflict. The existence of these two characters solidifies an important fact. Since the dragons faded to obscurity, or even during their time on Avalis, the idea of aliens being real was little more than speculation. While we're unsure of the extent of Brevin's forces, it is clear that he has access to technology that is similar to that of the dragons, namely his own version of Pangu, Syntax. 
Syntax differs from Pangu in that she is generally more sadistic and is way more fun to look at due to her 7th force bullshit. Brevin is also in possession of a kind of substance that allows him to mutate organic creatures. This substance and its limitations is never explained or really used unless we're to believe his forces are mostly made up of it. Game-wise, all that matters is that it's used to fight huge versions of Mila and Serpentine. Speaking of which, one of Brevin's trusted generals, Serpentine, is a constant antagonist in game, taking up four encounters worth of boss slots overall and is refreshingly dangerous and competent. Like Brevin, he is a bit of an irredeemable shit and is unquestioningly loyal to his lord. One thing we can gather from this is that reptilian races are considered off-worlders, though it's odd to see the denizens of Avalis refer to him as a snake as if they know what that is. In my opinion, this is fine, it does well to differentiate the character designs like this, and it is adhered to in the second game as well, so kudos for that detail. In the first game, the only portrayal of civilizations we have are the three kingdoms Shangtu, Shangmu, and Shui Gong. Beginning with Shangtu, all we're aware of is that it's ruled by an extremely wise magister called the Magister, I guess, who's also the game's narrator. It's implied that Shangtu are the ones who have monopoly over the Kingdom Stone, and according to the archives, the Magister is more of a spiritual leader, which is why the stone gets stolen so easily in the first place. Shui Gong is mostly used as an antagonistic element, but from what we can gather, it is more isolated than the others, probably due to the mountainous region it occupies. It is due to this that we can assume that the initial takeover by Brevin goes unnoticed by the other kingdoms. It has a sizable military, though how much of that is bolstered by Brevin is unclear. Honestly, Shui Gong, and by extension Dale, suffer pretty heavily at the hands of the writing, but we'll get to that later. Compared to the other two kingdoms, we see more of Shang Mu just because the aesthetic of electric excess just looks really good as a gameplay stage. Mei Zhao, its ruler, is openly corrupt, managing to become mayor every term, as well as surprisingly smart and especially well learned, being the one who originally regales the tale of the dragons to talk. Easily swayed by promises of power and riches, he's vain and predictable, but those riches and that power still make him a hefty force amongst the three kingdoms. Jumping back to Shang Tu, we also have General Gong and Lady Nera, the Magister's trusted aides. Starting with Gong, he's the least antagonistic of the pseudo allies team lilac meat he's the only one that really trusts the group despite not kicking up a stink when they're incarcerated for a pretty flimsy reason nero on the other hand is outwardly distrusting she's basically a cop but according to the archives was a priestess who worked for the king of shui gong the whole panda thing gong and nero have going could be evidence that shui gong was their original home but otherwise she pretty much exists to enforce the will of the magister and also advise him it's noted that nira's background even her original homeland is never brought up beyond what's on her character description on the website even come the sequel where she's a playable character so that part might have just been written out completely it is interesting that i bring up the sequel actually because we don't have much to go on in terms of details when talking about the kingdoms when we're considering this as the first game analyzing the game without taking the more fleshed out lore of the sequel into account definitely leaves something to be desired which moves us pretty neatly into the next section Freedom Planet had a lot of potential with its world, and by potential I mean that this is a fucking fanfiction goldmine. By the time this video is out, the game would be like a decade old, and the writers at the time were likely in their own fanfic era, since you probably also need to add a year or two to the timeline when the writing began. This game evolved from a Sonic fan game, and Sonic stories weren't exactly narrative bangers. So at this point, you're writing a story on the bones of a franchise wherein the world of the game barely matters. But that's the point though. This story is made for a game, not an anime series. It doesn't have the capacity or time to redesign the world to cater for interesting ways the Kingdom Stone can transmit energy, or to redesign the familiar tech around the Kingdom Stone, or to make the magic that exists entirely separate from the Kingdom Stone actually mean something, or to allow nuance in any of the characters, or to build a world that would be massively changed by the huge plot twist. However, and this is why I can't stop thinking about this goddamn franchise, the story barely misses several opportunities to capitalise on what was actually written. For example, the whole thing about the dragons coming from space is shoved to the side haphazardly because the actual threat is looming. The implications of this are powerful. Uh, no? We could have had the Magister stuck on the old ways, sending Lilac on a useless quest that ends up with his worldview shattering and him losing hope. It could be Lilac, then, that suggests a plan to exploit the dragon's legend to stop Shang Mu and Tu from fighting, which in turn gives her a little more agency as a main character and also pays off that rant from earlier. I wonder Brevin's gotten away with everything. Our leaders are too brain dead to pay attention to anything but themselves! Maybe this is the kick in the ass the world needs to stop relying on a MacGuffin to provide for them and find new ways of moving forward together. 
Instead, it feels like the Magister is the most important person, whether he's a voice in the void or just standing there, wise and perfect despite being very wrong, and frankly kind of a dick. For the purposes of moving the story along so you can get to overboosting your way through some goddamn robots, it's fine, it works, but man, it could have been more. As another example, I want to go off on Prince Dale, a character who I feel would have been far better utilised as a passive player as opposed to a frontline antagonist. <gasps> His motivation for causing chaos in the kingdoms is revenge for his father's death, but his brainwashed ass brain is completely unaware he's working alongside the one he's looking for. Like, that is tragic and really good. Problem is though, that he's now burdened with being a boss, twice fold, making weird creatures and robots. Team Lilac do nothing to try and stop him with dialogue, knowing full well that something is wrong. Kicker is that this robot right here didn't even need to be accompanied by Dale, who only exists to chew the scenery. It's absolutely not the case in game, but if we saw Dale just kind of hang out at the palace and run things so Brevin remains anonymous, it could have opened up some interesting narrative prospects. It would also make it hit harder to see Brevin hanging out on Dale's throne and making the actual king stand subservient and hollow. The heroes that attempt to stop Revan in that one cutscene could be pleading to the king to come to his senses, but he just ignores them as they're obliterated. It's then spun as an assassination attempt, and all is set back to normal. It could have spurred Spade to action when Carol approaches him, realising that they were aware of this earlier, but not believing it until actual career heroes go missing. As the game is coming to a close, Dale, who Brevin has no use for anymore, would be sent out to kill Team Lilac, and obviously Spade comes in and stops them. We could have had Spade reassure us that conflict is not in his brother's nature, thus the fight broke him in a way that only Spade can fix. That way we can tie up that loose end, while also acknowledging Spade was wrong to have brought the idea that Shang Mu and Tu were in on his father's murder. With that, Team Lilac and the player can concentrate on the finale. What we ended up getting was a series of events which culminates in this bizarre exchange between Lilac and Spade. Spade! I hate to disappoint you, but I'm just passing through. Have fun saving the world. Look, I'm sorry, okay? I was scared. I didn't know what I was doing. You still don't. <laughs> what the fuck are you guys talking about? It seems Spade was supposed to see the truth when he accompanies the group to the thermal base to save Lilac. Due to the cancelled DLC never coming to light and the script not changing to reflect that, we're just meant to accept that Dale's brainwashing was cured off screen with no consequences. These are just a couple of elements in many that could have been expanded on had the gameplay, I assume, not been the focus. But compromise is a part of development, especially in the action platformer genre. There's only so much nuance that could be injected into so many characters in a game too small to contain all their stories. As a result, this game falls for some amateur writing traps such as arcs that kind of fizzle out or just resolve, half-baked world building that tries to be something more than what it actually is, focus being dragged away from interesting characters, and in some cases, a lot of unnecessary edge. Far be it from me to tell a writer that they can't be an edgy little guy. You are like us after all. Now you're just being nasty. <laughs> but sometimes you have to give a measure of thought to how you portray violence and the consequences of it within the world you're writing. I bring this up because Freedom Planet has a tone problem that ends up being massively abrasive given the general aesthetic of the rest of the game. It certainly doesn't go out of its way to be explicit, but the game also has to be inventive when the world isn't cartoony enough to not have death be a real concern. One particular way they do this is to have the player explode into feathers or something when they get absolutely annihilated. This rule is broken before it's even put in place however, as shown in a hilariously easy to miss cutscene involving Brevin's knife and the king's head. No. Is this a bad thing? Of course not, and honestly this isn't me saying that scenes like this don't have a right to exist in this franchise. What I am arguing for is consistency. You see, at this point you'd forgive me in thinking that not seeing anything like this again for like two thirds of the game is bizarre. 
The closest is watching random heroes get exploded into confetti during another cutscene, but since it's an instant strike and the entire body disappears, it's infinitely less stark than having to look at corpses. Thing is, very early, the line was already crossed. The edge returns to form in that torture scene. My first playthrough, I was massively caught off guard by Lilac's screams when Brevin rams untold amounts of bolts through her in an attempt to break Tork's will. It wasn't until Brevin did it a second time, because he wanted to, and Lilac's sprite turned into a charred mess, did it hit me that this feels massively out of place. The immense cruelty of this scene definitely didn't need the mutilation of a 15 year old girl to make a point we're already acutely aware of, that being that Brevin is a ruthless piece of shit. Looking slightly left of Lilac in the scene, you also see her hair whips draped over a railing sporting a spot of red, which is the only time anything close to blood is shown. If it's okay here, why not also in the king's uh, neck hole? Also, Sabrina confirmed that Lilac's hair can harden so she can use it as a weapon, which means these aren't tendrils like I originally thought, and hey, did, did Brevin fucking scalp Lilac? What the shit? At this point, Galaxy Trail have spent artistic effort on fucking up this character beyond recognition and put her through trauma, only to have it completely undone within minutes, which begs the question why it even happened in the first place. Indeed, the only payoff this scene gets is a vague allusion to it right before the final set of stages. There was even an entire scene earlier in a tent with Tork and Lilac where this could have been talked about. Instead it was used to remind us that the Kingdom Stone is still important or whatever, instead of affirming that Lilac is okay, simply because, well, of course she is. She's infallible, which renders this egregious torture scene pretty much toothless and ultimately unnecessary. The final example of this weirdly out of place violence is the mutated character boss fights. So, uh. <clears throat> Remember when I said that you punch a hole directly through Mila's face and wasn't joking? Well, it happens right here in this fight. Yeah, you see that hole through her head? I'm, I'm sorry, you killed her. So, yo, we're just gonna leave Serpentine's eye hanging out for half the fight? That's, uh, that's kind of fucked up. However, it doesn't really matter. Once they change back, no consequences. They're fine. Mila has a cry, job's done. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna say a 10 year old should have PTSD or a lasting injury thanks to this moment, but man, for how far the game is willing to go to hurt her, it sure feels like a cop out to not think about the long term ramifications of it. Honestly, that's what it boils down to. Are these characters meant to grow or are they just cute things to kick the shit out of for a cheap gut punch? And if they're just used as a cheap gut punch, at that point, why not just kill them off? And well, <laughs> real talk, I didn't want these characters to die because I was invested in their well being. But rather, if any of them did, it'd just be an irreparable downer. Luckily, Freedom Planet isn't that kind of story. But its lack of anything profound to say about its violence skirts the edge so much that, in the end, it amounts to no more than a bad case of tonal whiplash. Honestly, that's just a shame. <sighs> Alright, now that that's out of the way, let me cook for a minute. So I implied earlier that Lilac kind of lacks agency, and most of that is derived from her unshakable hero trope. She spends a lot of the game being told where to go or failing missions that she put on herself, and yet none of this really affects her, which deprives her of much needed character arcs. The subservient nature of Lilac in retrospect kind of undercuts the freedom part of Freedom Planet. I just wish she was more willing to call people like the Magister out on their mistakes, and more willing to take a page out of Carol's book by caring less about being a model citizen. Hell, maybe that way she'd have the self-awareness to apologise to Carol for actually dragging her around because <laughs> Carol's absolutely right when she called out Lilac in the cave. Yet. Carol was the one to apologise for leaving her, and Lilac never addresses this despite us seeing glimmers of Carol's own struggles. Lilac saying that them being kids doesn't mean anything is a sign that she's completely disregarding Carol's fears, and honestly, it's kind of messed up that she never acknowledges this. In fact, fuck, this is kind of a personal one, but nobody knows how to apologise properly in this story. It's, it's especially egregious when the Magister's first instinct upon seeing Lilac can barely stand is to offer her a chance to redeem herself instead of, I don't know, heal her? By the way, you're looking a little... <sighs> Fuck, it doesn't sound anything like that, why am I even trying? Oh, by the way, you're looking kind of crispy. Uh, we'll heal you if you uh, do this important mission for us. Hey, Lilac, do it. Look him right in the eye and say, Fuck you. Fuck you. you just do it, do it. You need to. Honestly, there, there's a lot of stuff that's only popped up now that I've played the sequel, which means, frankly, it's probably best I shut up at this point. 
So, you know what? Let's pivot to some positivity to round out this video. If I had to pick a couple of things which I really enjoyed from this game, one of them absolutely would be the antagonists. Lord Brevin is a bloody good villain. Hell, like, all the actual villains are fun and great. The decision to waive any sympathy the player could garner for them was a correct one. Brevin has genuine charisma and actually feels like a threat. And also, Serpentine is a joy. It's just nice to see an underling treated with respect, even if he's a massive jobber. The whole virus thing in his backstory is honestly best ignored and it's good that it's never brought up outside the fandom pages. It just feels right that this guy would follow Brevin as one complete bastard to another. Also, as much as I spent a fair bit of time ragging on it, I am happy the story is at least willing to go darker than the initial design depicts. It's not impossible to write some pretty mature stories with dope animal characters, and even though this game isn't that, it's awesome to see the attempt to be made. For me, the story and the characters, they have enough charm to excuse the rough first time voice acting, and everything I just talked about, and never got to the point where it ruined my enjoyment of the game. It's a passion project that retained the passion, and even though it screams its love for anime and its action platformer roots a little too hard at times, I can't help but love the result. So why did I spend however long this video is talking about a decade-old game containing fast furries? Well, uh, I'm a huge fan of Freedom Planet 2, and uh, let me tell you, my brain worms off at when it comes to that game. It's just, Freedom Planet could have been a really good foundation for its sequel. But even with its flaws, the ambition, the design, and the dedication to the attempt won me over as much as the gameplay did. Revisiting Freedom Planet was a good ass time, and it makes me excited to start banging on about its sequel. So, I hope you enjoyed, and stay tuned for the next one. Oh, and uh, um, no, play Freedom Planet. It, it, it it's really good. O okay, bye. with us, buddy, whether you like it or not.